Look at verse 3. Notice he says, For of him unto whom much is given, much is required, and he who sins against the greater light shall receive the greater condemnation. We, we're going to get later on some of these ideas where, where the Lord's going to refer to talents. Where much is given, much is required could tie in very easily to that parable of the talents where God gives one man five talents, another man two talents, and another man one talent according to their individual or several ability. It's fascinating to me that the guy who had five talents turned them into ten, and he was told, well done, thou good and faithful servant. The guy who has two talents turns it into four, and he is told in the exact same words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. In the Greek text, those two are given the exact same response from the Lord. It wasn't God saying, come here, Mr. Two-Talent Guy, stand next to the five-talent guy. Hmm, you only have four, he has ten. Oof, it's not looking good for you. I love the fact that God won't grade you and me on the curve. Can you, could you imagine Judgment Day, me coming up before the judgment bar or you standing there and the Lord saying, okay, uh, let's see, Nephi, would you come up and stand next to Tyler on his left there and uh, Enoch, why don't you stand on his right? Okay, let me look. Ooh, Tyler, it's not, uh, it's not looking very good for you. Um, you're not really measuring up. I love the fact that we have heavenly parents who have endowed each of us with these divine attributes and gifts and abilities and, and weakness and struggles, this, this package that is unique to you and my package that's unique to me, and he's not comparing me with Taylor or with you. There is no comparison horizontally. Where much is given, much is required and he, he knows what he's given me, and now I have to try to magnify that set of constraints and that set of, of gifts that are given to me. It's a powerful principle that God knows our potential and he encourages us to get there, and he gives us the support and help to get to that potential. And if we choose to walk away from our potential, if we consistently turn away, if we hide our talent yeah. buried in the dirt, and say, I'm just going to go put my life in the dirt and just kind of wait and st for the second coming. Like, no, like you had the potential to do X, Y, Z. You had the potential to do these things. God will call you a, a faithful servant if you are continually striving to achieve your potential. I have to say, um, I, I work in an educational context, and I often think about this very concept because I have to pass judgment on students around their mm -hmm. performance. And I remember uh, some years ago thinking, what I would love is to know exactly where every student is at and what their potential is, and given all those circumstances, given the constraints of the teaching term, did those students measure up to their potential given where they were starting, the resources that we made available, and their efforts? And then I just realized, okay, I'd have to be God to pull that off, but boy, that would be the best way to grade students. Yeah. But God is the ultimate perfect judge because he knows all the things, all of our weaknesses, our foibles, our strengths, our opportunities. So using that as an analogy, it's fascinating if you consider that if, if a person is given that much capacity from the Lord, where much is given, much is required, and another person is given this much capacity from the Lord, can you see how easy it is for us as individuals on this fallen world of ours to look around horizontally and make judgments where this person could easily look down his or her nose at this other individual and say, oh, I am so much better than you. But perhaps that person from heaven's perspective is doing far better than this person with what they've got, what they've been given. I'm going to build on this. So this person could completely reach their potential and get to 100%, okay? And this person might get all the way up to here and they're 75%. Now they've done more, 
but they had greater potential. And so God is going to say, well done, uh, well done, thou good and faithful servant. This person will say, um, mostly well done, <laughs> thou mostly faithful, faithful and good servant. <laughs> Three quarters. <laughs> Sisters and brothers, as we look at each other in our families, in our wards, in our work, in our, in our colleague relationships, rather than being prone to point a finger of accusation or a finger of judgment at people around us and pointing out what's wrong with them, perhaps we could learn from the Lord's disciples at the Last Supper and be more prone to ask the question, Lord, is it I? Is there what lack I yet? What could I do better? I, I, I don't want to sound preachy here, but I don't know that it's very fruitful when I kneel down and say, Heavenly Father, I'm really struggling with so-and-so. Change him. Make him do this better so that he doesn't – so that I can like him better, so that my life can get, get easier. From my experience, those prayers haven't been answered very often. But when I kneel down and say, Lord, I'm struggling in this relationship, teach me. What could I do to, to grow, to learn, to be better, and to even help this individual? We pray for those who despitefully use us. By, by covenant obligation, we're commanded to pray for our enemies. So we pray for them, we don't pray against them. And in the process, we figure out what God wants us to do to become more like Jesus, more, more loving and more kind and more facilitating of these, these beautiful attributes growing in the collective group of Zion.